next level. <laughs> now hot the water. Buckle up. They just to do what's yeah, yeah. See them with their big belly. Then go they use religion to cause plenty confusion. Sometimes the tribalism, poverty and nepotism. When hunger fire person, you go weak, you know, go fit talking again. Thank you for staying with us, or should I say thank you for joining us since we're just starting. Now, recently, bandits abducted no fewer than 287 pupils, and I wonder if they put those pupils in their pockets. Uh, from a primary and secondary school in Kuriga, a community in Chikum local government area of Kaduna State. Days later, they abducted some Sangaya students at Gidam Bakuso in Gada local government area of Sokoto State. It's a school that combines Islamic and Western education. Nigeria experiences one of the highest rates of kidnapping for ransom globally. And to buttress that point, between July 2022 and June 2023, that's a space of 12 months, no fewer than 3,000 495 people were abducted in 582 incidents across the country. Hmm. That's according to a report by Lagos-based risk consultancy, SBM Intelligence. Now, to look at this kidnapping business with us this morning, I'd like to welcome two security consultants, uh, Mr. Mike Agio for uh, his former director, Department of State Services. Good morning, Mr. Agio for. Good morning. And we also have Sheyi Adetayo, a security consultant. Thank you very much for joining us. Good morning. Now, um, Mr. Agio let me begin with you. Um, this thing has been going on now for a long time, and it seems to be getting worse. And the temerity with which they even take place is another thing entirely. So um, can you just um, talk to us about the underlying social, economic, and political factors that have made this thing continue. Mr. Jaffa? Yeah. Yeah. The, the issue is quite, this persistent kidnapping is quite disturbing to every well-meaning Nigerian. And uh, if you look at uh, the socioeconomic <coughs> impact on the country, it's it's real huge. Uh, one has now come to realize, even though we didn't start now, that um, kidnapping, as it were, has become an industry mm. because people use it to make money. Now, you recall that we used to have robbery. We hardly record incidents of uh, robbery now except in the suburbs where you have a burglary, a house breaking, and all these things, where people's property like TVs are removed. The quickest way to make money now is through uh, kidnapping. And uh, uh, because it's not been fully checked, people are encouraged to go into kidnapping. But you know, we have three types of kidnapping. We have the political kidnapping, where your political opponents are kidnapped, you have the economic reasons, then you have the religious uh, aspect of it. What is going on now in the North, like this mass kidnapping, is both uh, uh, religious and uh, economic. In the South, you have uh, the issue of uh, economic and political. 
that uh, like in the southeast where you have uh, the IPOB, they use it to get money and also uh, for political agitation, especially people who, support, who don't support them. They are kidnapped, money is collected, and eventually killed. But the most disturbing aspect of it is this uh, mass kidnapping of school children. Because it discourages uh, parents, especially in the north, from sending their wards to school. And that will be helping to further their, their interest, the interest of the perpetrators of this uh, kidnapping. The people who come out to say that Western education, like Boko Haram, for instance, that Western education is uh, forbidden. And uh, they seem to be pursuing that agenda. And that is quite, quite disturbing. I be, as we move on, I think um, we'll look at the other issues, how is being handled, government efforts, and the people's efforts, the citizens' participation in checking this menace. You know, let me quickly follow up on that, uh, Mr. Joffo, before we go to Mr. Retail. There are those who would say some of these issues that you have raised, in fact, we've had quite a number of uh, people talk to us on these issues and say, look, it's primarily the failure of intelligence. And we all know, at least primarily, that one of the major functions of DSS is to, is to provide what you call actionable intelligence. Do you agree with those who say that it's failure of intelligence that occasions these things? Well, I, 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 I don't agree with that. There's, there's no failure of intelligence. I can tell you that uh, intelligence is quite available. In fact, not only intelligence provided by the state security service, the communities also raise alarm because at times you see these uh, bandits or terrorists coming up to give uh, notice that they are coming to such communities. But the problem is the issue of capacity of the enforcement agents, the, the police, the army. These people come in large number and fully armed, more armed than our security uh, agencies. And they don't have rules of engagement. If you confront them the way they are, that are just coming in, despite the fact that we don't have the capacity and capabilities, that is, I'm talking of our security agencies in handling this thing. If you engage them the way they come in, in large numbers, you have a lot of collateral damage. Look at the issue of, you know, I, at times I sit down and begin to wonder how such numbers are moved. Are they moved by food? Are they moved by vehicles? Are they moved by or by trekking and all this? It causes a, a lot of concern, you know, when such huge numbers. You remember this is started in 2014 with Chibok uh, girls, and that's 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 very very disturbing. Okay. Well, there are more, okay. more, more issues on that one. Uh, yeah, more issues on that one, Mr. Joffo. Let me, uh, let's uh, have uh, Mr. Detail's uh, opening comments on this matter. Well, Mr. Detail, you have, you've also been in this for a while. We just understand now that between July 2022 and July 2023, about 3,500 people were abducted in 582 incidents across the country. Don't forget that this, we can say, well, for whatever reason, maybe this was because it was an election period between July 22 and um, July, July 2022 and June 2023. But then even in this year alone, we've had some very disturbing cases. 200 moved at some point, almost 300 children moved at another point, some 15 people in Sokoto, and a number of people also in the SCT <coughs> here and there. Are there... Um, Tracks, are there things, features, common features to all of these things that might help us to resolve these things? Or are we just, we just playing drama? Ayo, thank you so much. Um, let me start by saying that um, even election is the reason why those figures were even low. Because normally it is believed that during election period, uh, criminals are actively engaged in politicking, so they do less of crimes at that period. So if it hasn't been for the election, the, the figures that you had will have been higher than that. And um, I'm afraid to say this, 
that um, in coming months and years, the numbers are going to increase and um, it will continue to increase. Um, the, the, the reality of our situation, we've been talking about this um, for a long time now. And um, it seems that um, we are not ready to uh, do the right thing. So, Mr. Adeta, I thought now, you were going to fo follow up immediately with the reasons that, for your belief that these figures are going to increase. Yeah, it will continue to increase because um, all that is on ground are measures that are uh, temporary measures, momentary measures that can only address a particular incident or cases. We've not actually done what we need to do to address this issue from a national scale uh, uh, to, to address it. Uh, I mean, and, uh, uh, from from national uh, outlook. Now, let me say this categorically: no government in the world has been able to solve problems like this using conventional means. And as long as we are using conventional means to solve this problem, we will continue to have this problem facing us and increasing. We've been talking about this for a long time. I remember as at 2014, I've been on TV talking about our approach. And our approach are predictable. Let me give you an example. Look at the problem that is happening in Plateau State. The solution that was brought about was go and establish a division in that area. And that is predictable. It is the military style. Will it solve the problem? It's an intervention, but that does not have the solution. And as long as we continue to handle issues using the military style, the common thinking. Now, let me tell you this. The current service chiefs, they are brilliant people, but they are no more brilliant than those that have been there before them that have not been able to solve it. All the solutions they are presenting now are not different from the solutions that have been presented before them, only that they are all wearing different garments at this time, but still providing the same panacea that cannot solve the problem at this particular point in time. And the last time I was on TV, I spoke about what we need to do. Now, let us look at this. For and for proper governance in a nation, rule of law must stand. And rule of law means that everybody must obey or must be guided by the law. And that will help us to be able to establish law and order. When we have law and order, we can guarantee security. It is when the security is guaranteed, that is where the economy can thrive. And when the economy can thrive, that is where you can talk about you know, the social well-being. We came about schools, a safe school initiative, and everybody went on the street jubilating that there is going to be a solution. And I said it then, safe school initiative is just an intervention, cannot solve the problem. Let's look at our schools. The schools are majorly the way they have always been when the society was safe. Major schools, most of the schools in the north, they don't have perimeter fencing. And the children are be going to school, coming back home safe. Today, we are talking about how do we protect the school? If the community is not safe, it's not protected, if the killers are lurking around in our forests, in our communities, it is not only the schools that will not be safe. The palaces are no longer safe. The royal fathers are being kidnapped. They are being killed. The, the uh, worship centers are no longer safe. Worship centers, people are being kidnapped there. No path on the road. You cannot even travel from one community to another without you being afraid of being kidnapped. It's not just about the school. It's about the problem that is facing us, setting us right in the face, and we're not looking at how we're going to solve it. All the interventions we have, been, we have made are interventions that can only provide temporary relief and not solve the problem. Now, the last time I spoke about the need for government at this time to declare the national emergency on insecurity in Nigeria. And I'll give an example. You see, World War II wouldn't have been able to come to an end if the leaders at that time did not take unconventional measures to stop the war. Roosevelt was president before Truman. And it was when Truman came in and he said, you know what, I'm going to do something different to end this war. And he did it. If government is not ready to do something different now, and one of the things they need to do right now is to call the National Assembly leadership. If you can make a law, amend the Constitution, 
to change our electoral act within three months, then you can make a law, number one, to review our criminal justice system, where it takes 10 years, five years to prosecute a kidnapper. The laws are there. You kidnap people, you carry gun, you die by, I mean, by firing squad. Or nobody, and I had the last time, in the last three years, show me one kidnapper arrested with gun, arrested in the course of kidnapping, that has been prosecuted and they're sentenced. So, None. So let's ask. None let's uh, let's ask. Me, that, that's a very good point because a number of people have also raised the same issue, Mr. Uh, Mr. Desa. So let me ask Mr. Ejo for that particular question. Is the issue of consequences? People are wondering these things will continue if there are no consequences. There are those who are even alluding that maybe because you know some of the uh, things that are happening here, uh, they are they are done or perhaps even staged by people who who have one influence or the other. The governor, former governor of Zamfara State, who is Minister of State for Security, made a comment at the time that some powerful people were behind some, some drama that happened, you know, when he was governor and they kidnapped some, some students. Uh, the Minister of uh, Solid Minerals has made a comment along the fact that some people are behind insecurity in, in mining communities. Just recently, the governor, the... Uh, um, Minister of the FCT also came out and said that some kidnapping cases, just about two days ago, that some kidnapping cases are sometimes staged. We have also heard the uh, essay to the president on media and publicity saying that some, uh, some, collab some kinds of uh, sub-regional forces are trying to destabilize the government. If these things are known, are they, uh, w what are the consequences that we should be talking about here? Are you saying that the laws are toothless or the people to enforce the laws are toothless. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. Mr. Data, Mr. Data raised a lot of issues. But most importantly is the issue of consequences. He has asked a question. How many people have been successfully prosecuted since then? In the past 10 years, how many people have been successfully prosecuted and uh, convicted? That's about consequence. He also raised the issue of a uh, safe school initiative. I recall that in 2014, $10 billion or thereabout, or $10 million, was budgeted from government and private uh, uh, partners. Raised another 10 Now, what is the position of that? Who is accounting for that money? What has, been, what has that money been used for? How many schools have been uh, uh, faced? Because these schools, like you also said, have, they don't have perimeter fencing. And that makes the school very vulnerable. Lack of consequences in action. Corruption. Like it said, and God forbid, that if we don't keep corruption, Corruption will kill us. Look at what is happening in the National Assembly. It's, I, it, that, that, that's, by the way, because that's not what I'm discussing. But I'm talking of consequences of action taken. All those budgets that are being presented for irrelevancies should have been channeled to security. What is it? This year, for instance, we have uh, the highest budget in terms of uh, security. But if you look at other uh, subheads in the, in the budget, you can see that there's so many irrelevancies in the budget. So we need to review that, apart from consequences for action that are lacking. Now, you look at the, 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 the budget as I, as I was speaking how much welfare for the staff of the security agencies, employment, training. Because if you don't get these people well equipped, we are heading for disaster. We need to review our strategies. We need to look into, because without security, without conducive environment for businesses and economic activities to thrive, people will be running away. Industries are being killed, people are discouraged, people don't go to farm. So there must be consequences for our action.
if we must move forward, we need to change tactics. Mr. Jeff, let me take you back a bit uh, to an earlier question about intelligence. You said you didn't agree that it was a failure of intelligence. I mean, if the uh, security forces do get intelligence that uh, such and such a place is going to be attacked or kidnappers are going to show up and do their thing, um, how come uh, forces are not deployed to that location? Because their presence alone will deter the kidnappers in one way or another. If one or two or three of them are taken out, won't that send a, a strong message to them that the security forces are not playing, that they mean business? Yeah, you see, you see, like you rightly said, if it's a lack of intelligence, if you recall that at times when such information is obtained, such intelligence, military is deployed, the police is deployed to such areas. But again, I've talked about capacity of our, our forces. And once they know that these people are deployed because the intelligence has been provided, they go to another area, diversion. They go to another area for attack. So it's like I, I said, I continue to emphasize that it's not the issue of intelligence that is lacking, but the capacity of our uh, uh, action agencies to carry out their duties, which of course is no fault of theirs. If you look at deployment of uh, technology, if we de deploy adequate technology in these areas, you should be able to see the people when they are moving in. But they operate in the forest. We, we, when they are moving in, you can deploy the Air Force to go and attack them because of their number and the sophisticated arms they are carrying. But this is a lacking. Okay. Hmm. Where what? is the light to operate all these, uh, the electricity to operate all these uh, well, gadgets? you know, Mr. Jeffo, there. There, are, there are those who but would say th these things, my apologies for butting in, there are those who would say this thing is in the purview of complaints. But let me ask Mr. Adetayo, if he agrees, if you agree with um, Mr. Jeffo on that particular matter, saying that, you know, first of all, it's, it's not the, 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 in the capacity of the individuals, but in the technology or facilities that they need to get things done. He's also talked about infrastructure as one of the reasons that we are unable to curtail this trend more than 10 years now. Do you agree with him? Well, Ayo, um, let me say, yeah, I don't disagree with him, but I, that we have critical issues that is missing. You see, have we been deploying technology we have? You, you cannot, it cannot be enough. And that is one. Uh, the issue of intelligence, there is no there is no way DSS will know if an uncle is planning to kidnap his, his niece because he wants to extract money from his cousin. <laughs> or, 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 you know, these are things that happen. So you think that a DSS official will not know if someone or a group of people are going to kidnap 200 people or 300 say, children from a school? Say, say, say Ayo, if kidnappers today want to kidnap one million in Nigeria, they would do it successfully. The what? solution is not the solution is not about gun most what? times. So let me let me I, hold on. Let me give an example. We're having similar situations in the US where people will go to schools with guns. And what did the US government do? It came about a school safety program where they bring in school, uh, I think intervention officers, you know, and when people were complaining that guns are being brought into school to kill children, you are permanently bringing guns into the campus with police officers there to protect them. When the solution actually is, remove guns from the society, but the pre no president in the US is ready to offend the fourth, fourth amendment. And that is the issue. The issue we are having here in Nigeria, the solution is tearing us on the face, but we need a, a I mean, president that will say, I am ready to move away from the unconventional. And I'll let me give an example of what I said before, the last time I was here, and the solution is this. The president needs to call the National Assembly leadership and say, you know what? Our criminal justice has to be reviewed. We need to set a separate court for this. And we want prosecutions to be done within three months. You are arrested. You are caught in the act. The laws are there. These are the courts. Employ more justice. Mr. Judges Mr. 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 Adesayo, while I understand what you're saying, my apologies, while you are, I understand what you're saying, what I understand the police act to say 
one of the primary functions of the police is to prevent crime, not to fight it, to prevent crime. So how are we doing in that regard? Add also to the fact that we've also talked about you know, some infrastructure of government, soft infrastructure of government, that if the security apparatus of each local government was functional, they would arrest the issue before it happened. So I'm I talking agree. about, I'm, the thinking here now is about prevention. You said it the other time, Mr. Adetayo. We had a life like this before. We didn't have to go this far. But now there are those who are complaining that the local government's administrations are not even working. They are not even effective in the first place. Consequently, these things, consequently, it opens us up more to these vulnerabilities. Ayo, you are talking of an ideal situation, an ideal environment that when those laws were made, were to protect the people. One thing we are missing here is that Nigeria is at war, internal war. We have non-state actors, every part of the country. We have soldiers deployed in every part of the country. We have military operations taking place in the north and the south, everywhere. And then you are still thinking that, we, we still believe that we're in an ideal nation where the content of the Nigerian Police Act and our constitution as it is now can provide the required safety for us. We continue to deceive ourselves. We are in a war situation. Tell me, a country that is at war, they ask, is the Ukraine constitution or, or, the, or their police act, can it work in the present Ukraine? Because they are at war. We need to change the way we do things. Mr. Adetayo, why I understand what you are Ukraine. saying, and I understand the, 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 the perfect, the, your perception. Results. I understand your perception, but I still, I'm saying this. Look, we're at war. We're at war. We are talking about budget padding. We are talking about some people going away with three point something billion dollars. And we're at war. Mr. Adetayo, come on. Governors, say, just a second. Governors, uh, go, state governments, go to the FAC meetings to collect their next. allocations on a monthly basis. And we're at war. If we were at war indeed, if we are seriously at war and it's something that only the federal government can handle, how come the state governments still have the time and whatever it is to sit at neck, uh, at neck meetings to collect allocations for their states and local governments and the monies are not deployed for the things that they are supposed to do? We understand that each state government, or whether it is state government, governor, I don't know, collects what they call uh, security votes. What do they use those security votes for? I, and we are still at war? Sorry, sorry, I, I, I need still, some understanding. You are still speaking to the same thing that I'm talking about. We are at war. Corruption is at war with Nigeria. <laughs> Inefficiency. You know, we are, we, are, we are trying to cheer ourselves apart. It is, it, is, it, is, it is a national calamity that we are faced right now. And we need to take, you see, talking about, I gave an example the other time that no major, you know, successful event is in the world has been made without somebody doing something unconventional. And that is the reality here. It, and everything starts from the top. The Mr. President started um, his, 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 um, his, his uh, term by making a radical, taking a radical action. And I'm expecting that he, I know that he has the capacity to move into the next stage now and take a radical action that will permit through the, whole, the fabrics of the entire nation as we speak now. Now, coming back to the issues of security, you see, I, I have, I have, there was a time here when I tried to break this whole thing down. But the truth is that if we don't get the criminal justice right, no intervention that we make can work. Because the people that are benefiting from this will continue to benefit, will continue to put in more money because they will make more money to frustrate our action until we get the rule of law and the law and order right. Mr. Adesayo, do you so think the... the taking everybody to answer for yeah. what they have done. Mr. Look Adesayo, at our prisons, for example. For, with all the information that's gone out since at least that I am aware of and that's still, still in public domain, since 2001, and um, prominent Nigerians are saying that we know the people that are behind it, we're going to name and shame, mm -hmm. we're going to do this, we're going to do that. Are you saying that by, by any chance 
that the people behind these insecurity are unknown. They are done. So what is, holding, what is holding now, us when, down? When you say, what is when holding say, us from dealing with them to arrest the situation? You are coming back to what I said. We need to do the unthinkable right now as a nation, and it has to be led by the leadership. We must hit the nail on the head. Somebody must be able to be the true man of Nigeria. There must be somebody right now, and we're looking at the president to say, you know what? We've been using this same approach all this while. It's not working. It's not giving us. See, see let me tell you something. When President Buhari came into power, his belief was that he was going to solve this problem, and he meant well. But the reason why, as at the time he finished eight years after, the problem became bigger than the way he met it. Well, because the people that were advising him were still giving him the same pattern of solution that the predecessors were taking. Only that those solutions were wearing different garments. Okay. Let, let's, uh, let's, ask, let, 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 let's ask uh, Mr. Gio for what he thinks now as we wrap this uh, particular com conversation uh, up. What, in your opinion, should we be looking at now? You've spoken to the need for uh, energizing the security agencies and security apparatus more. He has spoken to the need to adjust the, um, the criminal justice system so that we can manage the consequences better. How about the security operatives, all of them, at least 13 that we have? Is there, how about collaboration? Because there, there those complaints still come there, come from there. There are those who also say that at the top echelon, they don't have a problem. But when it comes to those, the foot soldiers, there is the challenge of execution of some of, some of these initiatives. What should be done, you know, if we're going to deal with these issues in that direction? Well, as a follow-up to the question you asked uh, Mr. Adetayo, first of all, you must identify people behind this. The people in the, in the forest are just food soldiers. They are being sponsored. And even though I'm not supposed to make that uh, statement here, a lot of the sponsors are under investigation and observation which, of course, the SSS will not come out to tell you. And that's why I'm encouraged, too, uh, by the statement made by the president that no dime will be paid, although that has its own implications. No dime will be paid. And that means changing of uh, strategy. And we cannot continue to encourage these people, especially this mass abduction of uh, mm -hmm. students. Mm -hmm. Let us see how this is going to work. Like it's always said, that the blind man tells you that he's going to stone you. Is that holding the stone in his hand or is matching it? So for the president to come out to say no dime will be paid. No government, no government encourages that. Now for the, opera uh, for the operatives, I think so far there has been Synergy, cooperation among the agencies, which of course is what expected if we must win this war. Let us also get involved, get the citizens involved in participating in this squad we are facing. We should not leave it to our security agencies alone. There's no way in terms of manpower, in terms of equipment, that they can, but they work on the information of the people. So the people also need to be mobilized, to be security conscious, know their environment, and support our security agencies. That's, mm -hmm. your, that's one of the best ways that we can move forward in uh, fighting this uh, scourge, which is threatening the stability of this country. And our politicians who are involved in some of this, either they are making money out of it, and this should also be aware that they are being watched, mm -hmm. and the long arms of the law we still catch up with them. So, Mr. Jaffa, uh, in closing, what long-term strategies do you think that the government needs to employ so that we can bring this to a halt? Yeah. The, 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 the long-term strategy, we are talking of immediate solution to, to our problems. But the long-term, I have always emphasized 
is localizing our security architecture. We need to amend our constitution. Like uh, where, where your colleague there said before, every state has its own security vote. Virtually all the states in this country have their own uh, uh, vigilante. And this could be formalized to state police. We need to get this architecture in place so that they know, the people who know the environment should be able to assist the federal forces, the secu uh, security agencies, to ensure that they collaborate again. Without it, we, uh, although some people have uh, criticism for establishment of uh, state police, but we cannot run away from it. I think it's one of the best ways to solve me, our problems by me, localizing me, our security approach. Mr. Adetayo, your last word, please. Okay, let me close by saying this. Some time ago, someone was arrested, some band of criminals were arrested in the state. And the criminal looked at the police officers and said, I know you, and I'm coming back for you. Mm -hmm. That is the level of boldness that criminals are having in Nigeria. They know that they will come back, and they have been coming back. And some of them are actually running operations right from the prisons until we begin to make people to answer for what they do. This will continue to fester. Thank you. Well, before you, before you sign off, because I know that it's time to sign them off, just to let you know that there are some people who are interested in this conversation and they have responded to some of the issues you've raised. Mark Onju says via an email, thank you for your valuable contributions on the subject. But please, what chooses a fence around a school in an isolated settlement in Nigeria? Taking out a fence made with cement blocks is too easy and does not offer any protection to the schools. Let us not think that the criminals we are up against are naive. As from Makon, cool. the second one says, I would like to remain anonymous. When Boko Haram has been recruited into the when when Boko Haram have been recruited into the army as repentant members, how can the military operate without these repentants giving information to their cohorts? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sheyi Adetayo, security consultant, as well as Mr. Mike Ejiofor, former director of the Department of State Services. Thank you for sharing your mm. insights with us this morning. Mm. Well, just to also know, I don't think the military is going to take kindly to the fact that some people believe that Boko Haram members have been recruited among their midst, because I remember that conversation came up before. So let's just put that out there. It is what some people believe. It is not the truth. But because when, when things don't seem to be going in a particular direction, people tend to fill in the gaps, you know. So there are no Boko Haram in Nigerian military. Let's just put that out there. But that is what people believe, and it is not the truth. Okay, but some of them have been forgiven their sins. And then what happens to them? Reintegrated into society. Okay. We do not have records that I don't think the army is going to take them back. Okay. Sunrise will return in just a moment with another interesting conversation. Please join us. Imagine lovely meals you can cook with these ingredients. Mm. You spend heavily, but no guarantee of a tasty meal. Not making a right choice of seasoning cube can ruin your meal, money, and confidence. For a tasty meal, do not compromise. Choose gold. Use Terra Gold for the rich, consistent taste your loved ones crave for. Good for soups, stews, and jollof. Terra Gold. One cube, endless possibilities. Where's Glory? Excuse me, ma'am. Hello! Where glow now? I dare you. Don't go village. Tie all our customer. Abby. Everybody pay attention. See, now glow break it at 10x. Now he might they take attention, my customers. Now he they dash me 10 times the credits when I load. Why even some me double data join? Yeah, yeah. Yes. So with one five minute give on the bus, so you they enjoy up to 15,000 naira credit and data. And I say I never finish you. See, you know, say we enjoy if you not join Glow Breakit at 10x. You not go get 1,000 naira welcome credit. Really? Glow, you don't win. You not see there yet. Hello. Please, I'm looking for Glow. Please save now Glow with the five. Now Glow with the go. Okay, so enjoy 10 times the value of your recharge on Glow Breakit at 10x. 
You also get 1,000 Naira for calls and data and double data bonus on your subscription. We are passionate about two things in Nigeria. The first is football. The second is our rice. And nobody celebrates like a Nigerian. So, for every goal scored, every mark made, you can be sure to always come back home to rice. Celebrate with Nigerian Premium Big Bull Rice. Homegrown just like you. Big Bull Rice. Tasty rice. Nourished you. In a world hungry for goodness. splash of golden terra oil, a mom can transform a frown into a smile. Make a lunch hour a happy hour. Change no thanks into yes please. Provide care when our nearest and dearest needs it most. And resolve family feuds without blowing a whistle. Providing tasty, nourishing family meals is all that matters. The world needs moms because where there are moms, there is hope, happiness, and love. Golden Terra Oil or Pure Love. You know, before now, you just said, um, up Nepal. So that's when, like, power goes out. When internet goes down. When you have internet blackout, what do what you, do you say? say? <laughs> up Nitel? <laughs> no, there's no Nitel. Okay. So mm. what do we say? Uh, up internet. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank God we can laugh about it now, but it was not funny in the course of the week when... That major internet. Th Thursday morning? Yeah. It was? Yes. It was horrible. Yes. It was, you know, it affected West and Central African countries. And um, the Internet Observatory Network said operators of multiple subsea uh, uh, cables reported failures. The statement said that main one submarine cable carried a significant portion of the international traffic into West Africa and provide services to multiple countries, hence the magnitude of the impact. So the issues are abundant. We understand that said that the process might take one to two weeks for repairs, but uh, two to three weeks of transit time may be required for the vessel to pick up uh, the spares and travel from Europe to West Africa once the vessel is mobilized. All of that conversation we want to have this morning with three um, gentlemen joining us here. Uh, Tony Mokware is president of the Association of Telecommunications as, uh, Companies of Nigeria. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank today. you very much. We have here Theodore Chukudi, who is, of, uh, Networks, who is a Network Solutions Architect. Thank you for your time. Thank you. We also have um, engineer Iken Namani, CEO Medallion Data Centers Limited. Uh, he's also joined us on this conversation. Thank you so much, Thank Engineer, you. Yes, for joining us. Yeah. So let me begin Thank with you, you uh, Mr. McQuarrie. People woke up and this happened. Yes. So help us understand what's, what really happened. Um, because I am almost certain that so many people would have put themselves silly. So imagine you would need to transfer money to someone you have been owing. Hmm. You've been making promises, mm -hmm. and now you have the money to pay. And internet went down. Yeah. And naturally, I would assume some people would say it's village people. Was it village people? Well, it was not village people. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, don't forget, these are infrastructures, okay? And they are prone to some uh, issues. Um, uh, any equipment can go down. Um, even, even the likes of... Um, um, bigger companies internationally had even outages. Uh, there was a time that WhatsApp was out and some other, well, some other things like that. So these things do happen uh, from time to time. The good thing that's uh, for us in Nigeria is that we have actually 
multiple submarine cables coming into the country. Um, it's only about three of the total five active that were affected by this issue. So it is not like we were totally cut out. There are sort of countries in Africa right now, as we speak, who are totally cut out. Mm -hmm. Some haven't recovered since that incident. Uh, Nigeria has, um, and maybe South Africa have multiple connectivity. So we are fine, we are, there was a challenge, but we are still sitting pretty compared to other African countries. Theodore, um, main one's name kept coming up in this matter. Yep. Um, are they the ones who own the cables that go, the subsea cables that come into Nigeria majorly? Um, speaking to that, main one is one of our biggest traffic carrier. And if you look at, as at the time when the cable came in, and now more of our services have gone online, you know, due to making internet cheaper and affordable to users. So main one, is a major, major carrier. Mm. And, you know, there are other service providers that rely on that on their fiber cable, mm. you know, on their undersea fiber cable for internet passage or traffic passage through West African coastlines. Okay. You know, so in turn, if anything happens to that cable, it means that the major traffic coming into the country, you know, would reduce okay. not totally out because okay. we have other subsea cables that, you know, that are backing up you know, main one, okay. but they are okay. one of our major carriers. Okay. Um, staying with you, um, when we were, a picture was given to us, I think it was on, on uh, CNN or so. Yeah, yeah, sure. And, you know, what crossed my mind was, what could possibly cause this kind of um, rupture in huge cables like that at the bottom of the sea? So there are different factors. So it could be it could be human error, you know, it could be as How? a result of... At the bottom of the sea? What are humans <laughs> doing be, down there? Be, yeah, it could be as a result of maybe a ship passing towards that red uh, line, because they are meant to actually avoid that Those line, things. considering that coastal guards would keep them off that, you know, lane. But sometimes, you know, mistakes do happen, and the ship could drop an anchor, and an anchor could damage the cable. Also bearing in mind that these cables are manufactured to specification, you know, considering also the, the geographical terrain where these cables will pass. So before these cables are manufactured, you know, some kind of survey, monitoring, data gathering, you know, is acquired such that these cables are manufactured to um, specification. So if by chance um, these cables damage, it takes actually about five to six weeks, depending on the level of damage. So it's, a ship has this to be deployed. This one was major, wasn't it? Uh, it's, it's major. It's, it's major because some countries, as at now, are still cut out. So a ship has to be deployed that is specifically built to manage and retrieve these cables. Then slicing professionals have to also be deployed to slice and now redeploy the cable back to the seabed. Mm. <laughs> so nice. it's actually a process. And you know, money. How precarious is the situation, especially um, seeing that our lives have gone online, literally. Everything is online. Health is online. Education is online. Finance is online. Governance is online. How precarious a situation is it? Um, okay, thanks for that. Uh, and just to also um, further appreciate what the other two speakers have said, uh, currently, Nigeria in total has about uh, seven submarine cables actually serving the country. Uh, you've got the main one, you've got the Equiano, you've got Satri, you've got the Ace Fiber, you've got um, also a Wax, which actually is a consortium of so many uh, companies uh, also available. And then you have NCNC also that comes through Cameroon and the rest of it, right? Uh, as was said by the ADCOM president, about three of them, uh, Ace Fiber, Main One, uh, we have Glow One also, uh, which is currently very active and being used uh, uh, massively over the last few days also, right? So as was said, three of them got affected by this cable cut, uh, uh, and then by default, it affected the swapping of traffic. So what has happened, and which is why you are able to still see services online. I'm joining you now uh, on Zoom. 
is because the moment that happened, all that cables that were alive and active, capacity was not swapped with them. So we mm -hmm. spent the last two days truly swapping capacities, putting people on Equiano, putting people on Glow One, just to be sure that at least uh, traffic is restored. While, as was said, it's going to take a few weeks. Sometimes it may even run into months to restore the cable that is cut. So there is redundancy. But because this is probably the first time I can recall we had three of them went down at the same time. People don't know this, but over the last 10 years, I am a witness to the fact that at least more than 10 different times, cables have been caught. But we don't feel the impact because it's probably one cable at a time, and then uh, they swap and take capacity from others and restore. Now, it is bad for two reasons. One, because of the quantity that happened at the same time. So it was uh, more easily noticeable than what has happened in the past, as I said, I personally, because we operate the data centers where these cables uh, exchange traffic, I see this and I know it has happened several, several times over the last 10 years. But because this is three of them, majorly it's got more impact than in the past. Um, it is a risk uh, that will continue to be there. Thank God we've got Glow One. Thank God we've got Equiano, uh, especially Equiano that currently has the biggest capacity to take traffic in the country that was just launched last year. If a piano was not there, I wonder what uh, the case would have been worse than we are currently experiencing, right? So um, it's what it is. Uh, this calls for the need for two things. One, we need to as much as possible localize traffic, use more of we'll, the... We'll come to that in a moment, Engineer Naman. Uh, just a second. Just one second. Uh, we'll come to all those, but um, just to do some speed work, because we really do need to talk about permanent solutions as much as possible even though there isn't any such thing as perfect. But let me ask you, um, Mr. Mokwere, uh, to the layman, as far as we are concerned, is this telco? Is, um, is Tony telco? Yeah. Is uh, Chukudi telco? Is uh, Ike telco? They are not, all of them, okay. they are just bad. It's Chukudi net. To good net. Thank you. <laughs> they are bad. They don't know their work. Mm. Finally, they should leave this country. Mm. <laughs> How did you receive that? Well, it's a challenge. Um, like was rightly said. Um, I, I mean, I'm, I'm talking. How did you? How did you receive the perception of people? Well, uh, you know, the perception is it's mixed. Mm. It's a mixed bag. The major challenge is is the awareness and the knowledge. Of what's this you issues? Think people were aware that yeah. some cables were cut. If, even if I mean, you told me you are supposed I, to I, pay. I, I, spoke, to, I spoke to a, a, one, a customer yesterday, and I was trying to explain this. And <laughs> uh, how it come? I don't. Is that I don't care about this okay. international. <laughs> I just so, want my internet. I just want my internet. So it's it's like I said, it's a mixed bag of um, we receiving it. It's it's a it's a, it's a challenge. Like like was said, this is the first time. Um, this has happened to this extent that you have multiple. Um, and like, like I yeah. said, we are actually still comparatively. It's, it's a comparatively we are still in a better position than a lot of African we, countries. You said that one. Yes. Uh, no. You, yes. Of course, but for you, for the but, layman, mm. it's 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 a difficult thing to understand. Mm. Okay. But these things do happen, and the issue is. Like you said, what is the way of going forward? What are the solutions we're going to put in place? Um, the thing is that, like was said, we have already many more submarine cables coming in still. Um, as another com uh, cable that has come in now to Africa, which is landing, has landed in both Lagos and Aquaibo, and is even bringing more capacity. So Nigeria is actually um, more connected than most African countries, mm -hmm. obviously because of the size of our population, the size of uh, the market, and mm -hmm. things like that. When this thing happened on Thursday, yeah, strangely, uh, we were still able to connect to some extent with our data. Yeah, Wi-Fi's were down, yes, mm -hmm. but mainly we could still. I mean, how did that happen? So, so what? And which is what? Um, um, you know, we are still doing some speed work, like you said, but some of the traffic that are, were local were all still up. So what do you mean services that were local? So things that are within... Are they not all through the internet? No, but the internet, <laughs> there, are, there, are, there is data that is localized. There is data that is international. All local data 
for example, WhatsApp was still functioning reasonably. Yes. Okay, because WhatsApp is almost like a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, type of uh, communication. communication. So it's, it's within Nigeria, for example. It's not going, it's not passing the submarine cable out of Nigeria. So all communication within Nigeria was still up. And don't forget, it was not all the cables that were damaged. So those who were still, those still, that still had access to the existing submarine cables were still up at the same time. And also... You are confusing me. <laughs> you are confusing the layman I, like me. So, okay. Because I was still able to talk to my brother on WhatsApp in America. Yes, because... He's not in Nigeria, so, you say local. So, 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 so what, that's what I was trying to say. I am not understanding. So, so, so there is what is called an, an exchange point. Okay, so that exchange point, traffics are... Um, we are all interconnected, and through those existing cables that were not damaged, don't forget, it's not all cables that were damaged. Okay. Some traffic was still able to leave the country. But because of the impact, okay. three going at the same time, it just, it just, okay, let me put it in a layman term. Imagine all four of us hmm, are connected to, or let's say three of us okay. are connected to this one cable. Okay. He is connected to another cable. Okay. If we, the one, we still... so if the one that connects us three cuts, we are disconnected. Okay. His will be moving. Okay. Now, assuming also that there's also a secondary link that allows some of the communications we have to pass through him. Okay. So that secondary link that allows some of the communications we have passing through him will still be active. So it is what we will now be using yes. without even knowing that that's what yes. we use. But, exactly. on, but, on, but on a limited capacity. On a limited capacity. Because I'm on a capacity already. Yes. Okay. So if I send video, yes. it may not go. It may not go. It may go, but, but it may take, take a longer, longer time. time. It's very clear now. <laughs> Are you because, sure? Because on Thursday, yeah. I could not download any videos. Exactly. Okay. But subsequently, messages went yes. on WhatsApp. Uh, yeah. But any videos that came in, yeah. I was not able to download. I also want to Do you also... something, sorry, yeah. about, about yes. this issue because you mentioned something about May 1, May 1, May 1 being, um, you know, the real challenge. With Recurring. May, yes, but the real challenge is that May 1 was almost like um, a first mover at the time um, they, they actually installed their installed, solar yeah. game. They are, they, were, they are the earlier movers in that industry. So a mm. lot of people were already on, 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 on the network. And don't forget, these things are, it takes time to even connect and host. So if I'm already in this house and I'm, the house is working, okay. I, won't, I won't jump ship. Yeah. So, but, but also, I mean, one was able to restore mm. their services through those backup, backup links. links. Okay, which, which is, is what, what, what uh, Engineer Andamani said. Yes. Okay. Engineer Andamani, do you, I mean, to the layman, how, what's your perception? Uh, the, the two gentlemen here have spoken to their pers perception of how people received, you know, this, uh, this unfortunate incident. How did you receive it? How, how did you receive the feedback that people were giving, blaming your own, your own telco, the one that you started? as being irresponsible <laughs> because they couldn't control. Uh, well, well, well the, the first uh, and reality is, as we, we say in, in business, the customer is always right. So the first thing you want to do when there's a crisis like this is as fast as possible, try to restore the service. So before spending time to argue or even explain, more effort was actually spent on Thursday trying to restore service. As was said, the moment this happened, immediately uh, capacity was swapped with Glow One and Equiano. Well, Those two cables, a lot of capacity was swapped to bring raised, it up. Engineer Namani, just one second. On that issue that you just raised, isn't that a, it's a bit of a challenge? Because if people, I mean, you go into a bank for whatever reason, you are not able to get the transaction done, and they want to first of all get the transaction done before explaining anything to you. I think that might be a problem. Uh, how about the communication from the uh, service providers themselves, data service providers, voice call service providers, text, and all of those? What's yeah. your assessment of their feedback or, or of their you, response to people's complaints? You, you you are very correct. So now let me put on my cap as a user of the service, not as a service provider. As a user of the service, I use multiple networks. I must say, I think up to now, the only communication I did see was the one from NCC. My 
two networks that I'm on, none of them have sent me as a user message explaining what happened. So from that standpoint, I think the, um, the communication to the users needs to be better using this as a learning experience. The moment this happened, I suspect and I expect going forward with this as a teachable moment, all the service providers will probably have it within their uh, communication unit. When something like this happened, send out a blast uh, broadcast to subscribers, explain to them what is going on so people can even understand and be patient with you. Uh, I must confess that as a user now, not just as a network provider, I didn't get those level of communication from the networks. So clearly it's a teachable moment, which I believe uh, the industry should learn from and we should do it better going forward. Challenges come, as I've said, the key point is not when the challenge comes, but how fast are you able to restore it, which I must also commend them because I know people were working even as at 3 a.m. last night, I can confirm this trying to still restore some services that are still down. I know engineers are working. Ask me how you are talking, and because I am aware of what is happening at the back end of this. So effort is being put to remedy what you will call an act of God or force major. But the key point is, how fast can you restore service? And thank God, as we've said, Nigeria, along West Africa, have the largest number of submarine cables terminated, which is why, unlike some countries that are totally out as at now, we were able to still get some service going because the ones that are up, traffic was moved to them. And what other team operators have started doing is, which I, I think the ATCOM president also explained is, have multiple connections. So you are not only connected to only one submarine cable. I think this would further enhance that from a networking standpoint. Okay. We have connections to as many cables as possible. In case one has a problem, you have your backup also running. Now, Even let's if it's talk about system. those redundancies that I think it was you, uh, Mr. Mokwe, that started it, that look, we, it, it, those conversations around localizing our infrastructure. I, let me be honest with you. <laughs> I, I felt scandalized mm. that some cable from outside Nigeria is responsible for why we couldn't talk to ourselves. What in the universe did we have all these satellite dishes or whatever we call them for? So, so the main issue is if I want to access my bank, for example, why should my traffic, my connection, go outside Nigeria before it comes? Coming in. That's number one. Number two, are there points in Nigeria where I can interconnect with other people so that if, for example, there's a failure somewhere, it, I can easily reroute and still be active. The beautiful thing about Nigeria and the sad thing about Nigeria is that we have most of all these things available, but the utilization is always be the issue. We have, an, we have several internet exchange points, for example, and all the data centers, in fact, there are about three active ones, one even indigenous, which is very active. I have a service, and once we switched to that, um, internet exchange points, we saw a, about a 60% um, drop in our international traffic now being routed through these this, this exchange points. So we have these things. We just need to ensure that they are more utilized. Another issue that we need to see, because this content that we are talking about are domiciled somewhere. I mean, even in this building, for example, you have a data room where you have computers or servers, things like that. On a larger scale, you have what you call data centers. Now, the number of data centers we have in the country needs to increase. And sadly, although this is still develop, develop, developmental, a large chunk of them are concentrated in Lagos. Nigeria is a big country. We need more data centers to be moved beyond so it's, there's a larger discussion okay around this because it, it it goes to infrastructure the infrastructure investment the good thing we have the luck we have is that we are an attractive market mm. these submarine cables to come to nigeria is a huge amount of investment the, the the recent one that just landed is the longest submarine cable in the world it's coming to africa the longest in the world. I mean, we, I mean, this is to say we are a destination, but we need to put in, in place in 
in things that will ensure that these things will happen. Mm -hmm. There should be no reason why I am accessing a local bank or a local service, let me not use a bank, a local service that I should be stalled. We, we have even laws that stipulate how these things should work, because this is not new. I mean, it's not new. There's nothing that is going on that is new uh, globally. These things happen everywhere. So there are things you have to have redundancy, you have to have backup, there are so many things, and we, have, we even have a data protection law right now that encompasses almost all these things. Okay. So these are the things that we need to make sure that are being implemented. Is it for financial reasons that most of those data centers are in Lagos? No. Because there's a large it's, it's community not, of uh, internet users. Not, not necessarily, because uh, uh, you will be surprised that um, uh, if you look at the population of Lagos, what is it? The issue is infrastructure. infrastructure. So for a data center to be active, you would need a fiber optic cable. Like you see the, the, you see the submarine cables come to Nigeria. You would need those kind of cables also to go hinterland. Okay. Well, um, um, Mr. Chukudi, you are a network solutions architect. Yeah. What do we need to build? <laughs> you know, let Maybe me we use the building language for an architect. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so let me let me continue from where my senior colleague have stopped. He said we need infrastructures. Um, I can tell you for free that there are states within the northeast region that are not benefiting from the internet connectivity. And this is not because internet cannot get there. It's simply because the infrastructure for we to extend it to the average is not yet available. For is instance, there a market? There is a market. Is the herdsman going to be using the internet? Surprisingly. I can tell you for free that the headsman uses WhatsApp. For free. And they are let me give you an instance. And governors are aware. So let me give you an instance. Okay. Um, I spent the Christmas holiday in Plateau State, you know, and which is my place of birth. And I visited some local governments and villages. Um, I was opportune to meet a local man, you know. A Suya man who was who makes you produce kilishi. And after buying kilishi from him, he said, uh, he said in the local language, um, Oga, Kabani Nombanka, give me your number. And I gave him my number. He said, I'll send you a message on WhatsApp. I was surprised. Mm -hmm. And I paid him using OP. Mm -hmm. Now, which means, <laughs> hold on, which means he has OP account which uses internet as a service, and he uses WhatsApp to keep tabs with his customers. Yeah. So what does this tell you? It tells you that internet has gone to places we don't even know. But the challenge here is extending the infrastructure to them for it to be properly utilized within these regions yeah. is the major problem. Mm -hmm. Another major problem we're facing also is local sabotage. Maybe, for, for instance, construction companies might damage some of these cables, right of way. You know, I know some state governors have said, come in, investors come in, no more right of way, come and run your cable so that we have infrastructure and all of that. Mm. But more needs to be done. Mm. You know, there are those who will say to the last issue, there are those who put it straight at the docket of uh, uh, um, insurance. Insurance yeah. should be able to take care of that one. But is it a problem of funding? these infrastructure issues that you've raised? Um, to some extent, because running a data center is not easy. No. I mean, Mr. McCoy can attest to that, and yeah. my colleague online. You know, running the data is not, running the data center is not easy because you have to have at least, for you to be able to run a three-tier three data center, or a tier three data center, you need to have at least three sources of power. No. Stable power. Yeah. Okay, okay. Lead, leading me to this question to you, Engineer Namani. 
Do you think it is something state governments, and I'm sorry, uh, state, they are state governors. I am not on your case. I'm on your side. Mm -hmm. But your people are on your case, and these issues they may not be able to raise. I'm always asking about that one, because if we run a federal system of government in Nigeria, the federating units should have enough authority to be able to do some stuff. So, so the question that I'm asking you, uh, Engineer Namani, is it something states can take on themselves or maybe fund and have a PPP arrangement around it. I'm asking that against the backdrop of what um, Acquire Bomb State in doing, is doing with Ebom Air. I mean, that's a huge uh, investment, no doubt. I don't know if data centers are as expensive as running an airline. So do you think it is something that state governments should take on in the light of what uh, Mr. Chukudi has said here? Um, yes, uh, the, the straight answer to that is yes. Um, but taking it on, let them even do the easiest one they can do, which was also stated. Grant easy right of way. Make it easy for people to even set up businesses without taxing them before they even start operating. Make the permitting process a lot easier because the truth is, even the private sector is ready to finance some of these projects, but people get discouraged when, before you bring in your investment, things that you expect the states to provide, you have to provide it. Let me give you a simple example. We have a data center coming up uh, uh, just here in Lagos, also interestingly, right, for the two Africa projects. I personally, as a private company, have to build 4.2 kilometers of road just to be able to assess the site. We paid for it at our own cost. We had to run dedicated power from Aja substation all the way to that site. I kid you not, it cost us several millions of dollars to implement those two components that naturally should have been provided by the state. And the same thing we see in many places where you have to say fund what the state should have provided for you or the government should have provided. But even if you are willing to do that and you have the capacity to do that, the enabling environment without multiple taxations, without uh, delays in permitting, is what is currently impacting and affecting. The other part, which is very funny, and you'll be shocked. Today, and this probably explains the question on why do people still prefer to put some things outside, though it's wrong, it should be all in country. Today, if you want to get one gig of uh, IP transit from Lagos to London, it is 10 times cheaper than to get the same one gig of IP transit from Lagos to Abuja, though Lagos and Abuja are within the same Nigeria. 10 times more expensive because the cost of doing business in Nigeria is just too expensive at this time. So you are 100% correct. The state governments need to understand and appreciate the economic benefit of having a digital economy it creates 10 times more employment, generates 10 times more revenue for them from IGRO if these infrastructures are implemented and being used. They have to understand that they have to be patient to wait for these infrastructures to be implemented, support the implementation of this infrastructure before they start getting the benefit financially, which unfortunately at this time is the reverse. They want to collect the money and penalize you for coming to invest in some of these states. And that is discouraging investment into some of the states. Some have understood it, are trying to do something about it, but it's still very, very few compared to the rest uh, of the states. Having to fly to Paris because you want to go to um, Lume. It already happens. You make a call. Yeah. Once you make yeah. a call, what happens when you make a call? It first of all goes no, not one really. But you see, the, the, the challenge is still the issue. You, uh, you use the uh, analogy of the airlines. Mm. The reason why it's cheaper to fly to Paris and than to fly into Africa mm. is because of the number of connectivities. Okay. How many flights, are, how many of the airlines are operating within those areas? So it's the same thing. Is there a flight from Lagos to uh, Dakar? I mean, not many flights, even. <laughs> so the, the challenge one is, of, so, 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 so several things have come up in this discussion. And one of the things we have been talking as an association is to, to get people to understand that communication infrastructure is a critical national asset. Mm -hmm. you, this, this whole challenge has thrown up 
the, the, the real importance of communication infrastructure. We need to yeah. understand its critical nature and understand how, the number of dependencies yeah. as an economy that this infrastructure rely on. And it has or also on its infrastructure brought to my mind the issue of um, infrastructure sharing. How well is that going in the industry? For example, the data center is, is their, that's their primary business case. Yes. So the data centers we're talking about is pure infrastructure share. It's most of the data centers that are being, are being, we're talking about now, the, the main ones, even uh, uh, my friend Ike is, they are, they, are called, they are what is called open access data centers. So they are, they are carrier neutral. So it's not okay. being, yes. Yeah. Anybody so can use it. If you now need a service today, you can ask them and they can provision you. So, it's so kind of some kind of co-location. This is already done. Yeah. And okay. co-location is not only done on data centers, it's done on almost all communication. Fiber optic cables, for example, are shared. Mm. Towers, communication towers are shared, shared. already. We have several. Oh, that's so, so, so the issue is the understanding that, and this has thrown it into light, that anything that affects any communication infrastructure affects us directly. And what we should understand is communication, as we can now rightly see, is a fundamental human right. We, uh, we communication is a fundamental human responsibility, too. But let me, <laughs> <laughs> let me ask you, uh, uh, Mr. Chukwudi. Yeah. Um, I think it was in the course of the week. I let her don't laugh. Um, some media organization reported that government offices are owing discourse into hundreds of millions of naira in the service they provided. How do you, if, for instance, a, a state government takes on this responsibility of building data centers and all of that, because the assurance that state government officials our servants <laughs> will not become bosses who will be using these things without <laughs> paying. Consequently, um, running the business down even before it sees the light of day. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, let me, let me make, let me use, let me create a use case, right? So, you are aware that Galaxy Backbone exists, mm -hmm. yeah? So, Galaxy Backbone is supposed to serve all parastatals in terms of internet provisioning, infrastructure, and all of that. And I can tell you that they're doing a great job, right? But it also boils down to government doing the right thing. They know that they use these services and they need to pay for it. Because if you don't pay, Galaxy will not be able to run properly because they also need um, generators, power, you know, connectivity, exchange points, and all of that, as well as some other dues they pay. So. We need, they need to understand that they also need to remit or they also need to meet their responsibility for that sector to properly run. You don't just build an infrastructure and let it run. It will run on its own. It needs people to run. There's operations, there's maintenance, there's surveillance, there's security. There are a lot of building blocks that you know, make it what it is. So even if the government invests in this infrastructure, there needs to be that enabled manpower to properly run it. Okay. Engineer Namani, I, I want to ask, a, I don't know how to put the question, but do you see a situation where these things do come up, these infrastructure do come up, and um, what, what are the, maybe I should ask it this way, what are the infrastructure, soft infrastructure, like policies, laws, regulations that need to come up and be at play if we are going to do what you all have been recommending here, which is to localize all of these infrastructure in a way that, because there are those who would also argue that when these things go out one way or the other, Nigeria as a nation or any nation at that is, is, is open to any compromise. So what are the things that need to be done if Nigeria yes. were to go ahead and take on this assignment and the states themselves uh, of coming up with these data centers and other. What are the infrastructure that needs to come to play? How long should it take? How much would it cost for a state to have such and for the federal government, if need be, to be like a kind of umbrella body? 
Um, okay, thanks. Um, for starters, let's assume uh, you want to build a standard tier three minimum uh, level data center that is open access or career neutral. Um, the rule of thumb is depending on the quality you put in, for one megawatt of IT load, you need between 15 to $18 million to build it, right? It takes average of 18 months to 24 months from conception to completion. So that gives you an indication. Now, when you realize that for some data centers, you may need up to 10 megawatts, you can multiply that and see the volume of funding that is needed. Now, most of this for because 80 to 90% of the equipment you have to import. We don't locally manufacture them. So you're not start dealing with the issue of forest. Do you even have access to forest? How can you get access to forest? If you attract foreign investment, how do they get back their return on investment when the depreciation of the Nyla does not guarantee what your selling price will be today or tomorrow, right? So these are issues that needs to be addressed from a financial standpoint, okay? Now, from a policy standpoint, treatment of infrastructure, all of them, not just data centers, as critical national infrastructure that gives specific rights and privileges to the operators of this infrastructure have to be implemented. For many years now, we've been hearing that there's a policy on critical national infrastructure. We've heard that it has been signed, it has not been signed, it, and all stuff. But whether it's been signed, it's not been implemented. Somebody can still come today, cut your fiber on the street, and nothing happens to them. You have to go fix it at your own cost. You have to take care of it, and the person just goes cut free. Vandalism of telecom assets. So you cannot have a robust infrastructure to be used if it's being vandalized either intentionally or unintentionally, and nothing happens. There's no protection from the state, local government, or federal towards any infrastructure as of today. That needs to change. Then, of course, the policy of Nigerian cloud first. You want to take your service to the cloud, all well and good. But where is that cloud located? Which data center is that cloud service being run out of? All that has to be domiciliated within Nigeria. We now have very, very good world-class data centers in Nigeria. So gone are the days where somebody complains about the quality of the infrastructure. Nobody can complain about that anymore. Today, we've got the best data centers operators globally operating in Nigeria. So uh, from an issue of quality of service, we've crossed that point as of today. Okay. Now, that, there's no more reason why people should not bring in their data, sovereign data, and host it locally because the infrastructure to do that already exists. So okay. we've already passed that point, but it, these policies have to not be implemented by the government. But the more important one, which really goes down to the state level, is creating an enabling environment, even if you as a state, you don't want to invest in it, a private sector entity can come and invest if the enabling environment is there okay. for him to do business, operate efficiently, and be able to also make a return on his investment. Well, it's a, it's a long conversation, and um, I think we're going to have this one again, especially the part of localizing, you know, these infrastructure. Um, and, and I'm also very glad with what you guys mentioned, which is the fact that it will provide a lot of jobs for people, most certainly. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for being here this morning. Um, Tony Mokbere is president of the Association of Telecommunications Companies of Nigeria. Thank you very much. Um, Chukudi Theodore, Network Solutions Architect. Thank you for thank your you. time. Thank you so As well as Engineer Iken Namani, CEO, Medallion Data Centers Limited. Truly appreciate your time and your thoughts today. Thank you. So Sunrise continues with the next conversation we want to have this morning about budget padding. It's not even delicious in the mouth, but we'll be right back.
Fleisch tischt. Now, let me tell you about Safari Valley Eco Resort, the first of its kind in West Africa. Upon your arrival, you are introduced to your butler, who plans your itinerary. We were surrounded by wildlife from the moment we enter the eco park. So many activities, all in the same premises. You visit the gym or the stables, they have it all. At my break, I'm able to practice my putting. We also went fishing on a man made canal. Our tour guides taught us so much about the wildlife and how to interact with them. They used only a little to vehicles here. This creates a serene environment. I'm told it's over a thousand acres. My cabin here sits on two acres with a large terrace space overlooking my private swimming pool. Now this is royalty. They have their own farms, thousands of fruit trees. I can also have my lunch here at the waterfall. Quite a beautiful place you have here. Visit Safari Valley Eco Resort in Ghana, bringing you closer to nature. Do you know that you can now print all your essential items for events without even having to leave your home? It's the Cast Prints Combo Deal for all events. Yes! Weddings, conferences, birthdays, burials, etc. Starting from 495,000 Naira only. You get 50 invites, 50 A2 size posters, 50 16 page brochures, one large backdrop banner, one roll up banner, 50 jotters with pens, and 50 souvenir carrier bags. Whatever event you're planning, we can adjust to your budget and quantities. Just send your pictures and other information through WhatsApp and we shall send a design for your approval. Approve your design and we will produce with super high quality digital print technology. We can even arrange delivery to your location. Call us now on 0913-156-5016 or 0812-794-9323 or visit our social media pages. Cast Prints, digital printing at super speed. The Duchess International Hospital caters to every aspect of the family's health needs. A one-stop shop for maternity and child health services, emergency medicine and critical care, medical and surgical subspecialties, dental and eye care, and a range of other subspecialties and services, all available at a single location right here in the heart of Ikeja. And it really doesn't matter if you're paying out of pocket using your HMO or private insurance. We focus completely on providing that world-class affordable health care for all the family at all times. Thank you very much for staying with us, and I hope that uh, you've been enjoying the program so far. Uh, fresh revelations at the Senate plenary on Tuesday indicated that ranking, ranking senators got 500 million naira each for their constituency projects in the 2024 budget passed by the National Assembly. According to Senate rules, any lawmaker who has spent at least a term in the House of Representatives or Senate is considered a ranking senator. On the list of senators in the 10th Senate, at least 34 of them are ranking. With the revelation of the plenary on Tuesday that senior senators got 500 million naira each, the ranking senators must have got a total of 17 billion naira as their constituency projects votes. Whoa. <clears throat> um, <laughs> yes. Um, Beyond <laughs> show me a social comment. Excuse me. I just want to your 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 vo your voices became padded. <laughs> uh, Beyond show me a social commentator joins us from our studio in Abuja to, dis to discuss this matter. Um, Mr. Shomi, good morning. Good morning. It's good to see you again. Ah, ah. 
we haven't seen you in a while. Nice to see you. And um, nice you, are, see you, you are now in Abuja. Are there plans for... You know what I mean? <laughs> just, uh, just in Abuja, you know, for my own uh, purposes. Oh, okay. Okay, Mr. Shomi. Okay, Mr. Shomi. Now, this matter of budget padding, um, on account of which Senator Ningi has been suspended, um, when you heard or when you saw what happened on Tuesday, because it was televised live, and I'm sure being a social commentator, you would have seen it. Um, when you witnessed those scenes, uh, what went through your mind regarding the goings on in the Senate? Well, um, well, in the first instance, I think there are a lot of issues which um, uh, the whole debate and the suspension trio. Um, in the first instance, when you look at Ningi's allegation, of course, totally unfounded, the allegation that 25 billion naira was presented, you know, to the National Assembly. You know, that figure didn't exist. Uh, Tinubu presented 27.5 trillion. And then the same Senate, you know, upped it up to 28.7, uh, had 1.2 trillion to it. So uh, Ningi should have known that uh, the 25 billion trillion figure did not exist to start mm -hmm. with, and he participated in the whole processes. He's a very, very experienced um, senator. Now, the other aspect is, how do you deal with a situation like that? I beg um, your pardon, Mr. The Shomi. Senate Mr. Has, Shomi. Uh, I beg your pardon. Yes. The Minister yes. of Budget acknowledges okay. that the budget proposed and sent to the National Assembly was 25.2 trillion. And what was approved was 28.7. That's from the minister himself. I am not aware of that. Um, if you go back as far back as November, the figure which we have, um, which is, you can Google it, it's uh, 27.5 trillion. I am on they Google. They may as well. Uh, I, I yeah. quoted that from Google. OK. They may as well have prepared a budget for 25, but what was reported that I read, and which later subsequently um, also reported that 1.2 trillion was added to that budget. That is before Ningi. Before Ningi, we have had this controversy over why should they increase the budget, you know, uh -huh. uh, by 1.2 trillion. Uh, you will recall that. Yes. So when we've had that debate, uh, Ningi himself was part of the whole processes. If he had any issues, he should have raised them at the point of approval, not to wait till after approval. And in any case, uh, for me, I don't think that is the real issue that Ningi is trying to point attention to. Ningi is only playing on the north-south dichotomy. He made absolute reference to the fact that he believed the north uh, was shortchanged um, in that budget. But uh, whether that is correct or not, I mean, it's all in the air for everybody to see. But my own looking at that budget, um, uh, projects were allocated to virtually every zone in the um, in the country. Virtually every state will get one thing or the other, you know, out of that budget. So, when you actually look at the diversion, which is the issue of um, uh, three trillion uh, not tied to any particular project, so why didn't yeah. he complain at that point in time before the budget was approved? He didn't say anything like that, you know. So. Therefore, at times we need to see the ulterior motive of politicians. What they are saying is not exactly uh, what they are um, or, um, actually referring to. And that is what I see in the case of Ningi. But in terms of his punishment, again, I don't think the Senate uh, did the right thing. Um, there's nothing wrong in the Senate sanctioning him. But I would have preferred, I would have been more comfortable if they had gone through the, you know, the, 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 Normal due process of the Senate, uh, which is to refer Mr. Show, to just, just the one Senate second. ethics. Just one second. We, we can come to the consequences in a bit, but um, speaking to the subject matter itself, we also uh, remember Senator um, Adeola, uh, you know, known as Ola Yai Mileko. Ola Mileko, saying that he giving a detailed explanation uh, on the floor of the House. But what's of concern to me in all of these? is the reactions coming from people. For instance, according to budget, 
And you can find the information on the uh, Channels TV website saying that, look, Ningi, Ningi was correct, that there were no detailed explanations uh, as to the use of the fund that uh, contained in the issues that, uh, that uh, Senator Ningi raised. How does that come across to you? Yes, um, you know the the the. It's quite very interesting um, uh, that the Senate approved a budget. If the same senators that appropriated or approved the budget are now saying that some details are not available, it questions the very very process of um, uh, the decision making in the Senate. And this problem is always there simply because you have this issue of. Um, uh, constituency projects, which they one way or the other try to appropriate for and try to cover up one way or the other. And then you end up bringing up, throwing up new issues, you know, completely. Uh, because I do not believe the process of approving budget is a very thorough process. It will go through the necessary committees before the reports are finally submitted, you know, to the appropriations committee. And the appropriations committee, is, you know, is expected, you know, to tie every penny you know, to a particular project before presenting the final report to the senators, who in any case needs to preview them again and make up their mind whether they want to approve it or not. And that's a very thorough process. If you recall, that budget was submitted, um, I think it's end of November uh, 2023, and it was not approved until the end, I think about December 30 or something, uh, 2023. So they had enough time to go through it, have a look, um, but where I think the problem is coming up is when senators are also trying to play the role of executives by assuming that uh, they have a right, you know, to constituency projects, and in the process they tend to get, you know, their, their position tend to get weakened when it comes to scrutinizing the budget, you know, properly. But in any case, you can only blame the Senate, you know, for this controversy because in the first instance they were the one that had it more money, 1.2 trillion naira to the budget submitted. Mm. Mr. Shaomi, you have raised the issue of constituency projects, uh, which brings to mind, um, which would make one ask the question, what is the primary function of a senator of the Federal Republic of Nigeria? Or what are their functions? Yes. It's quite clear that... It's quite clear that uh, the, 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 the legislators, not just the senators, also members of the House of Reps, yeah. their primary duty, you know, is to make laws. They also have the, 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 the other duty of um, oversight functions over um, the actions of the executives, whether uh -huh. in implementation of projects, or uh -huh. budget implementation, or including, you know, looking at what the government is doing uh, precisely. But the moment you have the legislators now moving into the terrain of the executives, they themselves having to execute projects, then you are running a risk of the fact that they cannot be executing projects while at the same time carrying out oversight functions. And they also leave themselves susceptible, you know, to pressures from the executives because they should simply leave those, whatever they call constituency projects, for the executives to implement. But the current situation where, if what we are being told is correct, is that even uh, senators or members of the House of Reps you know, are allowed to nominate uh, contractors that will execute that project, you know, also leaves uh, so many questions to be asked on uh, the issue of um, uh, transparency, the issue of um, um, anti-corruption and all that. So they, they, they don't really need to get involved in that. If this, Legislators can extricate themselves from executive functions of executing projects. We will have a better legislature that will be able to carry out oversight functions, represent the people adequately, and probably uh, be able to scrutinize the budget uh, uh, appropriately without wondering, you know, there's a conflict of interest. When the senator is scrutinizing a budget while at the same time looking at the provisions made for him, you know, for his own constituency projects. You know, that, yeah. that tends to be a conflict of interest, in my view, in that, and I think we should discourage that practice. Mm. Uh, whereas the minister does admit that um, it is well within their rights 
to increase the budget presented to them, do they not also need to state exactly what the amount that they have increased it, well, the difference between what was presented and what they are approving, do they not also owe it to us to state exactly what that um, margin is going to be used for? Are yes, you with me? Um, every single penny in, the, in any budget needs to be tied to a particular function. Whether it's recurrent or it's capital expenditure, uh, it has to be tied to something. There is nothing like free floating money in any budget. Yes, I agree. Budget is an estimate. Um, is not the, the is, is not an um, exact cost uh, because a budget can be 70 percent, 50, 60 percent, you know, funded at the end of the day. They're just um, estimate projections, you know, uh, to work with. But the fact of the matter is. When you have a situation where you have the budget estimates, a figure being given out, and it's now leading to another controversy, different other figures are coming out, I don't think that is good enough. But if I recall correctly, I re remember clearly reading in the newspapers that 27.5 trillion naira was proposed, and I also remember that the, there was discussions around the Senate adding 1.2 trillion naira to it. I think the major issue now is the about the three trillion naira um, Ningi, is it Ningi or Jaribe or one of them, is claiming that uh, they, they has not been tied to any particular project. So that should really not exist. There is nothing called floating money in any budget. Mm -hmm. And in any case, the, the executive uh, will still have to look at the budget properly when it comes to implementation. There's the issue of what percentage of the funds will really be available, bearing in mind that we are operating a deficit budget to start with, and also our income um, is also projected, and it depends on so many factors. For instance, the income from oil depends on uh, the international price of a barrel of crude oil, so which can go up or down. So there's still a lot of variables where uh, the executive would have the opportunity of correcting this, and also um, we know we have a practice of supplementary budget, uh, which um, we, can be used to address some of these concerns you know, as soon as possible. And I don't think um, we need to create a situation where there is always controversy over budget. But a lot of it, if you really look at Dingy's complaint, a lot of it is stemming from the fact that uh, 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 some amount of money has not been tied to any particular project. But you can always blame the Senate for that, not the executive, in the sense that it is the job of the Senate to appropriate money, you know, for whatever, for, for any aspect of the budget. And they have that primary responsibility. If they have failed in that duty, it's quite unfortunate. Or, or should we say, maybe this is one-off, we don't know. But at the end of the day, the Senate needs to get its act together to avoid this kind of controversy in future. Hmm. Well, you know, I was reading... Um, Mr. Fashola's book, uh, you know, talking about national discourse. And um, one of the things he raised, the, 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 the former governor of Lagos State, one of the issues he raised is the corruption perception index. And he said something vital. He said, at least that I think is vital, that most of the time when we talk about the, the CPI, corruption per perception index, our focus is on the corruption itself and not the perception, which is the, which, which the report actually indexes and not the act of the corruption, the perception of corruption. How much of that do you think has played out so far, particularly in the light of the reactions that people have had to this particular issue of 3.7 trillion naira not been accounted for. And of course, you saw the reaction of senators generally to that which occasioned the, the, the punitive measure uh, meted out to Senator Ningi. How much of this perception issue has, would you say, is significant, that has smeared the National Assembly, particularly the Senate, more than is necessary? Yeah. Um... On this issue of perception, um, I would say Ningi 
in, again presented himself you know, very negatively. I would have been more comfortable with Nengi just talking about the issues of the budget without linking it you know, to, his own, uh, to, to, to his own ethnic or uh, zonal area in the country. That shows his, uh, he presented himself as um, um, not only biased, but as an ethnic national champion. And I'm not comfortable with that. Uh, when you now again look at the issues which he raised, he threw up issues that created the impression that there were infractions, financial infractions, you know, in that budget. And that pre precisely, I think, is why the Senate had to sanction him. I would have been more comfortable if he has been referred, you know, to um, Senate uh, Privileges Committee, Ethics and Privileges Committee, so that there is a proper hearing and then recommendation to the Senate on the appropriate sanctions um, to be taken. But that didn't happen. Yes, I agree. He actually brought the Senate into disrepute. But when you look at overall, look at the whole furore surrounding this issue, the impression being created, which is the perception, even though this budget has not been really implemented, they're just beginning to implement the budget. Now, the impression being created is as if there are infractions, as if some three trillion naira was meant to be shared somewhere, uh, when in reality there is no proof of that currently. And we do not have even any evidence that that funds has been released in any form to National Assembly for constituency projects. And also, uh, nobody has made any allegation about theft of public funds or corruption. But the fact of the matter is, the whole controversy has created a perception problem, which is about, oh, they have started again. Oh, they are deserving three trillion and have to be shared. Oh, they have started with constituency projects and all that. You know, these are just about perception. They are not real uh, as at today. That does not excuse the fact that we do not have financial infractions or corruption cases, you know, in, the, in any of the, um, the two hands in the National Assembly. That is not the point I'm making. The point I'm making is that it's too early uh, in the life of this budget, and I don't think we even have the resources to fund it currently. And I'm sure probably the Minister for Finance is busy trying to look at where to get the money to fund it. But already the, the controversy created has created the perception of wrongdoing, the perception of corruption, which in my view currently is not real because we do not have any evidence to back it up. But Mr. Shome, <clears throat> We, we heard on that day that 500 million had been given each to ranking senators, totaling 17 billion. That money had all, because some of them actually admitted that they collected 500 million each. Well, um, I have that too, but my own understanding of how constituency projects work is that the cash is not actually given to those um, um, senators that they are allowed to nominate projects. Maybe this is different now, I don't know. But in the past, they are allowed to nominate projects and then also nominate um, contractors. And through that, uh, the funds are paid to those contractors directly. Of course, that gives room you know, for some uh, bargaining, some negotiations between uh, the proxy contractor, you know, and whoever um, constituency projects is being implemented. So um, we all know the, uh, that system. But in reality, those projects are usually executed, you know, in those constituency. But if indeed it is true that 500 million naira is given directly to senators, you know, to implement projects. Again, I would say currently, we still do not have any evidence that they have not implemented that project because it's too early, you know, in the year. This is March. You know, okay. if in reality they have been given, then mm -hmm. I would say that they've left themselves vulnerable to perception of being corrupt. One. Number two, what mm -hmm. is their business, you know, trying to execute projects directly? Mm -hmm. Who will now carry out oversight functions okay. on those projects? Okay. They will now be reneging on one of the major duties of um, uh, of, of, of a legislator, you know, of, of a senator. If they are doing the project themselves, then who will now carry out the oversight function? Okay. And also, it leaves them in a weaker position 
you know, or being able to carry out oversight mm -hmm. functions on executive projects because they themselves are involved in the process of execution of projects. So these are serious concerns which need to be re looked into uh, by the National Assembly with a view to ensure that we can erase the perception of corruption even when they are not true, but simply because of the current practices of senators and uh, members of us of reps getting involved in the implementation of projects directly. And Mr. Shome, if you recall, one of them did say that uh, Ningi's action was calculated to cause disaffection between lawmakers and the people. Do you remember that? Yes. Yes. Um, yes, some... and I think he was making reference. Yes. Go ahead. Mr. Shomi, go on. Yeah, can I go on? Yes. Yeah, I think, I think the issue of um, incitement, you know, stems from the fact that Ningi made a direct, you know, uh, link between the three trillion naira, which is claiming um, has not been appropriated, or well, was appropriated for without being tied to a particular project, and the north. That is playing, you know, the north-south divide. A distinguished senator of the Federal Republic of Nigeria cannot be seen to be inciting a section of the country against the other. And that's exactly, in my view, what Ningi tried to do. That is totally wrong. And those senators that pointed, pointed that out to Ningi are also correct. Senators are expected to behave in a distinguished way. They are expected to think about national interest and not just their own uh, narrow interest. And in any case, when you take the budget and look at it, Ningi did not really have a leg to stand on because virtually every zones and every state in this country um, have one project or the other you know, appropriated for in that budget. So he did not actually cite examples of states where, or states or the whole north, where no project is going on. Of course, that is not correct. And mm -hmm. it's that incitement that probably would irritate so many people. We need to come off this old politics. We have election came, we all knew what we went through at the last election. We need to draw a line behind it. Our senators and our people need to be more united. We can be united in diversity. There's nothing wrong about that. But we need to be trying to build a country, not trying to split or continue to sustain you know, the North-South South dichotomy. So the, the job of building a united Nigeria, prosperous Nigeria, is not just for, for the Nigerians themselves. Our lawmakers are expected to lead in that process. In my view, Ningi failed on this occasion. Good place to anchor it. Mr. Biodun Shoumi, a social commentator who joined us from our studio in Abuja. Thank you very much, Mr. Shoumi. Sunrise, we'll Thank be back in me. just a moment. But, but before we take oh. that just a moment, okay. uh, allow me to take this comment from the previous conversation. And I think it's related to this one as well, one way or the other. Uh, Mohamed Awal from Hadija in Jigawa, wrote in uh, mail, says, for all of us, not security is for all of us, not just government. If you see something, say something. These kidnappers are in buses who supply them foodstuff, mm -hmm. medicine, petrol, and vital information, and some unpatriotic Nigerians, I beg your pardon, are some unpatriotic Nigerians. They used to pass villages before making attacks. Can't we inform security agencies? Thank you. That's from Awal, um, Mohammed Awal in Hadejia. This one also says, oh, well, someone is... Um, uh, drawing our attention to the fact that the president presented a, uh, the 2024 budget estimated to be 27.5 trillion naira. And um, we also have this one. I would like to remind the guest in the studio that Senator Ningi should be recommended, should be commended for his courage to expose the padding because it takes a lot to do so. He also says the guest is talking about a uh, motive. Who cares? All what Nigerians are after is people with such courage and determination to expose wrongdoings in the government. People, because we have to stop all sorts of corruption. 
That's why we are still backward after 60 years of independence. I was totally disappointed. Well, um, that's from Abdul Kadir Abubakar. Well, uh, I, I beg to differ with you on that one. We are not backward. We're just moving progress. We're just making progress a little slower than normal. Moving slowly. <laughs> well, moving. Summarizing. <laughs> moving right. Asked my guest as she sat with us here was, we are punishing our eyes, Abby. And she just simply said, yes. And we need to have some healthy habits um, in the area of our eye care. We haven't done any conversation, had any conversation about eye care habits on our lifestyle segment. But we, we're going to have that right now with Dr. Uzoma Okeke, who is a, an ophthalmologist. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank you. Good morning. So why do you say we are punishing our eyes? Um, we're punishing our eyes because there are certain things we do which we are not supposed to. Okay. Um, some of the things like um, people go on the system, the computer, they use it for hours on end without taking a break. There's a 20-20 rule, 20-20-20 rule. You're supposed to work on a system, iPad, your phone for like 20 minutes, and um, you take a break for 20 seconds and look at something distant for like something like um, 20 feet away. So we need to take better care of our pause, eyes. Pause, pause, pause. <laughs> <clears throat> so I use the system for 20 minutes. Yes. Then I look away from it for 20 minutes. 20 seconds. 20 seconds. Yes. And, and then rest I look your away eyes. At something for? Something distant, about 20 feet away. Is she 20 feet? No, she's not 20 well, feet. <laughs> 20 feet, 20 meters, just something at a distance. That's a bit difficult. <laughs> <laughs> because, I mean... Let's think about the children. That's where the bad eyesight starts from. Yes. I mean, a child is playing a game on her phone. Or just looking at the screen. And uh, you are saying she should do 20 minutes and then look. <laughs> Mama, how far? <laughs> no, we need to... I'm sure you say that to your children all the time and they don't listen to you. Well, um, we tell them all the time to not to be glued to all these devices because it leads to things, there's something we call computer vision syndrome, oh. dry eye syndrome, all these things result from looking at devices for a long time without resting your eyes. What are the signs of, what are the symptoms? Because you won't call, what are the symptoms of computer <laughs> vision syndrome? Computer vision syndrome. Maybe someone watching you right now has it. Um, you have things like strain, eye aches, redness, grittiness, and they complain, oh, my eyes ache from excessive exposure to all these devices. Okay. There was no computer when we were growing up, but yes. we still have bad eyes. <laughs> yes, we have um, bad eyes because we don't pay attention to okay. the things we're supposed to do. Things okay. like nutrition is, plays a very important role. I like to say that um, we're not just what we think, we are also what we eat. Okay. Um, things like fruits and vegetables, they have a lot of antioxidants, phytonutrients that help to protect our eyes, protect the area fruits of skin vision. Fruits and vegetables, people. Fruits and vegetables. So, they have come back for you again. <laughs> <laughs> so those things are very important. Carrots. You know, examination, annual examination for those who are middle-aged and above. Annual? Yes, annual examination. Okay. Yes, for, from a qualified eye care professional. And then even at milestones at birth, when children start school, and when you're about starting work, your eyes should be examined so that we can pick up um, signs and symptoms of diseases that are sometimes asymptomatic, like glaucoma. Because if it's detected early, then we can treat it and manage it. Do me one favor, madam, yes. before we get into um, getting too deep. Tell us the stages, if you can, of that the eye or our eyes go through through our lives, from um, birth. birth to toddler to and on and on and on like that. Are there stages that our eyes go through and what are the peculiar things we need to do, habits that we need to cultivate for each of those stages of our lives? Okay, so at birth, um, especially for children who are preterm, they have what we call retinopathy of prematurity. So at birth, the eyes should be examined. 
for developmental anomalies. Mm. And um, the eyes develop between at birth, from birth to age two. So if a child has refractive errors, that's a good time to pick it up. What's that? Um, refractive errors, inability to see clearly. So there are different types. You have myopia, hyperopia, um, astigmatism. So at a young age is a time to pick it up because after a particular age, the eyes may never get to see clearly. That's what we call amblyopia. So school age, before school age, the eyes should be examined to find out whether there are any refractive errors. Okay. For, for the parents, are there things they need to do in terms of caring for the child? At that yes, point? you observe. I see mothers, the children almost fall into the television and they think it's normal. So when a child sits very close to the TV or brings the objects to their eyes very close, know there's something wrong, they should go and see an eye care professional. Okay? Then um, they can observe, they should supervise the children when they're playing, because a lot of children come in with penetrating eye diseases from sharp objects. They hold their pencils and their pen like this, and they're playing unsupervised. They can fall on it and have injuries to their eyes. So these are things parents can do when the children are small to prevent eye injuries and also detect um, errors early. Okay, so from two, age yes, two? Yes, from, that's from age two. So you saw what, watch out for developmental uh, glaucomas, watch out for cataracts. So these are things, once you notice a child is not seeing very well, observe how they work. Observe their reaction to light. Some of them have, you know, when you put on the light, they turn their face away, they tear a lot. So some of these things will give you a pointer that something wrong, I need to have this child checked out. So these are the things we can do from age, from the age two to like 16, 18. And then when we get to middle age, it's important that everyone should have their eyes checked because from that age you have the incidence of um, glaucoma, cataracts, these are on the rise. So it's important that at oh, age... Why, why is that? Why is it on the rise at about that age? Well, um, a lot of things go wrong. We are the eyes. Yeah, <laughs> and age, I know, eating a lot of wrong things. Oh. Okay. So um, at middle age you should have your eyes checked annually. I, I, I can imagine someone asking mm -hmm. right now. What are the th wrong things to eat <laughs> that, that, has that is affecting someone's eye and the fellow doesn't even have any, any idea? Okay, um, uh, let me not say eat. Okay, like smoking. Oh. Smoking is very wrong for the eyes because it leads to early presentation of age-related macular degeneration. Okay? Um, smoking, it leads to early cataracts too. Even food, we need to have a healthier relationship with food. Because when we take a lot of carbs, people get predisposed to diabetes. Mm -hmm. And when they become diabetic, it affects the retina. So they end up with diabetic retinopathy, which can actually lead to blindness. So it's very, very important that we watch our health. We should be active, exercise. We should, do, we should have better health-seeking behavior. Okay. You know? Would you say that people are eating better now than, say, in the 50s and 60s? I think um, I'll prefer the 50s and 60s because then the food was organic. Um, people had, they go straight from the farm, they get their fresh produce, they eat more fruits and vegetables. Now we eat a lot of junk, which is not good for our health. You know, it predisposes us to hypertension and diabetes, all these um, non-communicable lifestyle diseases, mm. which eventually can make someone blind. Mm, wow. Okay, so from age 18 and up? Yeah. Any special? Well, at uh, 18, um, we should be careful about injuries. That's when young people, they can have brawls, fights, they can punch their eyes and say, oh, football, they can kick the ball at the eye. You know, those such things can, when there's any injury to the eye, it's important that you see an eye care professional to ensure that there's no long-term damage or complication. Madam, there is one game that is making the rounds now. Is it a game? Sports. Slap. Ah. Ah, have you seen any of those videos? It's a game. It's a sport. Ah, I, I can't even describe it. You stand in front, you hold something behind you, and then someone gives you 
No, the, the, those those slaps are a not good dirty. Whack. No, those slaps are not dirty. <laughs> no. Those those slaps are gosh, I don't even know the word. So the that word. that can actually damage the eye. You know, the trauma. The eye is enclosed in a bony socket. So when there's a slap, there will be what we call. Are you going to call those ones a slap? Well, how is no slap? <laughs> that is like a tornado to the to the to the to the face. That can result in a lot of eye injuries. So I think that game should be scrapped or it should be abandoned for anybody that cares about their eyes. But then the same goes for boxing, doesn't it? Yeah, but, but in boxers they wear they, they sort of they, there's something they wear, you know, that um, provides some, some sort of um, you know cushioning. So you don't get such punches in your eyes. You know, but when you hit your eye against something and someone, you know, punches you, it causes damage to the eye. It can even cause retinal detachment, macular holes. So such things are very serious problems that you don't want to have. Okay, madam, I, I want you to please recommend some kind of middle ground. Because in our world, this world as we have it now, let's talk about the adults because that's where we are right now. There's hardly any business you want to do that you will not use technology. And in fact, in organizations, there's hardly any time, in fact, I think it's in the Forex business, you can't even blink. Anything could happen in the, in the blink of an eye. And I'm supposed to take my face away from, for 20 seconds. Gosh. You could lose a lot of money in the 20 seconds. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Mm. So what, what would be your recommendation to such jobs? Okay, um, I would recommend that they have anti-reflective um, devices on their laptops okay. or even on their glasses, you know, have anti-reflective um, lenses. That would help. And then um, they could also try using um, artificial uh, tears or lubricants that would help moisten the eye as they work continuously on their system. And they should also try and take a break after working for so long. Okay. And to, how, how about, you know, is there any such thing as first aid for eye care? First aid, um, I would suggest that um, if there is an injury to the eye, please head straight to a qualified eye care professional. Let them look, because sometimes it looks innocuous, but there's serious damage going on at the back of the eyes. And it's only a professional that will be able to detect and manage appropriately. Uh, Doc, there's, a, there's what I sometimes would like to refer to as an old wife's tale, that um, if you wear glasses, you get to a certain age where your eyes begin to correct themselves and you don't actually need glasses anymore. Is that true? What happens is from middle age, um, people develop what we call press biopia. So they have difficulty reading small prints. So they get to wear glasses to read small prints. And as they get much older, they're now able. It doesn't correct. What happens is that their changes go on in their eyes. So they call it um, second sight of the aged. So as they're getting towards their 60s, 70s, they're becoming more short-sighted because they're developing cataracts. So they're able to see better. So usually you have those elderly parents they making... They can see better with cataracts. With, with, no, all the cataracts make them a bit more myopic. So they're able to read small prints better. Okay, but eventually when the cataracts get much um, mature, they lose their vision oh, wow. and they have to go in for surgery. So it's documented. It's known as second sight of the aged. So they make fun of their middle-aged children. Oh, I've dropped my glasses. You still need glasses to read. Well, okay. I didn't. I didn't get to that stage in my life. <laughs> or maybe I'm not there yet. No, you're not well, there since yet. Since you use glasses, you know. But let me ask you, madam. There are some who are having issues with their eyes now, and unfortunately, you know, we we can't take any of those comments by phone or anything. But what are those signs that people should that indicate one? Situation or the other. I'm sure that another time we're going to have this conversation about. Um, eye conditions and all of that, but what are some of those conditions that, th those symptoms that once anyone sees or gets any of those symptoms, they should begin to give it serious attention? Okay, so um, from time to time, people don't even know that they don't see with one eye. 
So from time to time, have a target in your house. You cover your left eye, look, make sure the right eye is working. And then you cover your right eye, make sure the left eye is working. So is this what you're so, saying? So, yes. From time to time, check each eye to make sure that you can see clearly. Can and then if the eyes are red, it's important that you go and see your eye care professional. If you have things like um, floaters, we call it floaters, they see black things in their vision, so, and they keep on trying to catch it. You know, they see black objects moving inside the eyes. They see flashes of light. They see um, something like a curtain trying to cover their vision. See your ophthalmologist. Um, parent, you have an injury or something gets into the eye. Don't rub it because it can actually um, erode your cornea. So it's very important that if something gets into your eye, look for your eye care professional to take it out and give you appropriate drugs. And then people shouldn't use... Um, harmful traditional eye medications. You see all sorts of things they buy at the bus stop, they buy, they use um, holy water, they even put urine in the eye. Ugh. Mothers put breast milk in the eye. When a child's eye is red, there's discharge from the eyes. Who recommended it to them? They self-medication, they do that. Their, I've seen, their grandmother. Yes. <laughs> I've seen patients lose their vision from all this holy oil, water from the sea, they believe it has healing properties. Okay. So such things, when there's discharge in your eyes, don't even go, because they say, oh, go to the chemist. Don't even go to the chemist. Go to your eye care professional to give you yeah. the right drug you need. So, what causes tearing? Um, tearing can come from, if something gets into your eye, you will tear. Um, as we get older, the tear, there's laxity around the eye. The muscles begin to get lax. So you have... Um, the tear duct can get blocked, and then the tear duct can also, um, because of the laxity, shift a bit. So you're not, it's no longer aligned. So you have what we call epiphora. You can tear continuously. Glaucoma can also cause a lot of tearing. So uh, these are a few things that can cause uh, As well as bad tearing. news. <laughs> no, that yeah. one is not tearing anyone. That's crying. <laughs> <laughs> That's crying. <laughs> <laughs> now to children. Um, I have a running battle with my okay. little my little ones. They will lie down on the and sofa so and put the screen here like this and it's this close. Of course, I get fits every time I see that and I always pull them back. So they'll be wearing glasses at age 10. <laughs> so I literally say, pull this thing back or I'll collect it from you. Of course, it's daddy talking to listen. This TV is that big, gigantic, yet they still sit, sit in front. right almost like, okay, let me be look, following. Okay, okay, he's going there. <laughs> so, <sighs> but some parents think they're just children. They're having fun. Please tell us the implications of such behavior. Um, first of all, we need to be sure that that child is seen properly. Okay. Because sometimes you make them sit a distance away, but the clear. image is not clear, it's not sharp. So for them to see clearly, they have to move closer. So some of them have undetected refractive errors. So first thing, they should have their eyes checked. And if their eyes are okay, then you have to explain to the child, this can cause injury to you much later in life. This can bring on myopia so you need to move away from these things if they are seen clearly so it's important to first of all assess them make sure they are seen clearly before we begin to have discussions with them once they have a buy-in then they will move away they understand that oh if i get too close my eyes may go bad so mm -hmm. i better sit a bit away from these devices sometimes the the challenge is not with seeing anything on the screen so, or seeing anything around, sometimes it is with reading. Are there situations that differ in such cases where, okay, with this particular, for instance, some people can cannot drive without their glasses. Yes. I cannot drive with my glasses. And some people cannot, you know, there is this short side, long side. Some people still don't understand that. Help us understand some of these. Okay, ones. so let's start with myopia. Myopia we call short-sightedness. That means you see everything close to you, but things far away from you, you cannot see clearly. So 
those people need their glasses to drive because they can't see distant objects, okay? So that's myopia. Now you can't see the policeman. <laughs> <laughs> that you have um, hyperopia or hypermetropia. Such people can see very distant things, but things close to them, they can't see very well. And then we also have astigmatism. In astigmatism, the cornea curvature is not good. It's not well-rounded. So things are not sharp. The images are blurred. So these are refractive errors. Um, there's another condition, but it's not a refractive error. It's known as press biopia. At about age 40 or middle age, people lose their ability to read small things because of loss of accommodation. So in such conditions, we give them glasses that will make the letterings bigger. Do I, have I told you you're coming back? <laughs> you haven't yet. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here this morning. You're welcome. Because this is just the beginning of, of such conversations. Um, and you've spoken to... Uh, the need for uh, nutrition. Yes. Uh, some people on my left, they still need to drop some things. Please don't tell her I said anything to you. Thank <laughs> you for being here this morning. Dr. Usama Okeke is an ophthalmologist. Truly appreciate your being here. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Okay. Why? Why are you looking at me like that? Nothing. Okay. Well, we'll be right back for the... Yes, thank you for staying with us up to this point. Um, we have a really lovely lady who uh, grew up in Austria. Uh, her mother is um, Filipino. Can you imagine? Nigerian men, Unadewaka. And her father is a Nigerian from Ogun State. Her name is Rose May Alaba. Good morning, Rose. Good morning. Big ages. Good, thank you, dear. Your German is so impressive. <laughs> like, I'm still shocked. Well, 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 thank you, thank you, thank you, thank wow. you. Wow. So you people are ready to be in just a <laughs> <laughs> So, Rose, tell us, do you live in Nigeria? No, I'm, I'm based in Austria, in Vienna, but I come to Nigeria, like, every month, two, tri two times a week, like, a year. Slow down. Say that again, please, so that we can so, understand yes. you. Thank you. So, um, I was born and raised in Vienna. My dad is from Nigeria. My mom's from the Philippines. But I have been coming back to Nigeria since 2017 every year. Oh, every, How, year. every year. Every uh, year. A couple of times a year. So, what brings you to Nigeria so often? Well, actually, like, uh, when I started doing music, I've been doing music for a while now. Um, and in the midst of, you know, like, finding my sound, I got connected to my roots again. <laughs> I so, like that. Um, you know, I traveled back to Nigeria in 2017 um, just to, you know, to get connected with my roots again. But then um, I met, like, a couple of really, really great musicians, producers, um, and I was like, wow. I think I'm loving this vibe. I think I need to come back more often. And um, that's how I stumbled into Afrobeats, actually. Um, back in Austria, Vienna, Afrobeats wasn't like this big thing. I um, mean, it's still coming, but my friends used to always like play Afrobeats in the club. Like we have this really small community, Nigerian community in Austria, and um, they always represent the roots. So they're very proud Nigerians. I like the way you say you wanted to connect with your roots. Um, right. You know, when you said that, I remembered the movie Roots immediately. Mm -hmm. So uh, when you first came to Nigeria, GoPro. Um, so I started acting, first of all. I started acting three years. After I finished uh, with my degree in acting, then I was, I told my parents, I was like, I want to do music professionally. My dad used to be an artist as well. My mom used to sing. So my dad uh -huh. knows stuff about the business. So he manages me now. He's outside, shout out to my dad. Um, he manages me now. Um, and then I went pro around when I was like 20 years old. Okay. Well, first of all, before we continue with your sports, um, many watching right now may not know that you have uh, you have a brother in the defense of Real Madrid. Right? Yeah. Uh, I'm proud of him. 
Okay. So, which, football. which team do you support? Real Madrid. Oh, well, of question. <laughs> what what question kind of question like... is that? <laughs> <laughs> it goes without saying. <laughs> right. Right. So you just ah. say, which which opponent, which is the worst opponent of Real Madrid? That's, That's the one. That's the <laughs> <laughs> but how, how does that make you feel, really? I'm so proud of him. Like, he left home when he was really young. Um, he left home when he was 13 years old. Um, he left for Germany when he was about 15 years old and lived by himself. Uh, I always used to see him on the weekends when my parents used to bring me to Germany to visit him. But other than that, he's been gone for a while. And, um, you know, he deserves all the success that he has right now because he's like the most hardworking man that I know, apart from my dad. So you went into music because your mother sings and mm -hmm. your dad used to be an artist i grew up in a very musical household i used to see my dad on stage when i was like four years old um and that was like a big inspiration to me and then all of my like the family side of my mom everybody knows how to play one at least one instrument everybody knows how to sing Which like one do you play i play the guitar and um the piano yep i play the microphone <laughs> so you're holding it basically well, is what you're saying I, you can't cheat me I play okay. the microphone okay cool yeah good I'm just saying okay so you want do you like karaoke I play the microphone period okay. <laughs> got, so it. got it got <laughs> it okay so so why did you choose the kind of music you chose mm -hmm. and now you're um, as I, I, I used to use the word segue into Afrobeats. Right. Um, that's where I feel like home the most, mm. to be honest. And um, Is it because it's becoming more famous? No, I've been doing it since before it was like worldwide. It's because she's black, right? <laughs> Don't forget, she connected with her roots. Exactly. Let's not forget that part. And also, like, no, seriously, like, every time I come back, I feel like I'm home. Like, the people, they're just, everybody's just so proud of me that I represent their roots in a different country and that I didn't forget about them. And I feel like um, that's what also gravitated myself towards my Nigerian roots, mm. is to bringing it into my music. I'm basically, like, bringing my own life into my music. Oh, interesting. <laughs> but I'll be honest with you, I actually kind of like Filipino, Filipino music because of some peculiar precautions that they have, mm -hmm. right? Um, they don't really have their own style, to be honest. Oh, really? Yeah, <laughs> have you actually listened to Filipino music? Are you sure? Maybe I'm mistaking it for South, for, for South think... America. <laughs> Okay. Um, no, to be fair, like I love my Filipino side as well, but they don't really have their own um, music. They so have they hybrid all kinds. Exactly. The on, only thing they have is their own language, and they bring it into like if it's pop, if it's um, hip hop, if it's R and B, and just they just mix their own language into it. Interesting. Okay. So, what do you? Where do we go from here? Where does? your brand name go from here. Is that your, your, your artist name, by the way, Rosemary Alaba? Yeah, it's my real name and my artist name. Okay. Yeah. So where do you intend to take this journey to? Where is today's journey taking you to? Well, definitely, I want to, like, influence also, like, the re European market. Um, since I was, like, born and raised in Vienna, I want to bring Afrobeats um, into the, you know, European countries more and make it more known there. Because um, I feel like Vienna is a very traditional city. Like Austria is a very traditional country. So is Germany. Classical. And right. Hmm. Exactly. Um, so, but I feel like I have the power to actually like um, break this kind of tradition and make Afrobeats more known there. Okay. So, so I'm, I'm sure you've started that already. Mm -hmm. How, um, how are they? reacting to Afrobeats in Austria? I mean, they love it. Because they're very conservative. They're very conservative, you got it right. They're very, very conser conservative, but uh, I feel like um, by time, like Afrobeats will be so worldwide 
that they have to play it. It's, it's getting worldwide already. Exactly. You, you, so, go, you go to some event somewhere in the U.S. or it. somewhere in England. And you will hear and it. And during the break time, they're playing Afro beats, and your head is just getting bigger and bigger. So, <laughs> you went in the stadium. That's our music. Right. You, you go to a football match, an yeah. international football exactly. match. Exactly. During um, halftime, they're playing, they're playing our it. music. Come down. <laughs> <laughs> they're playing our music. Right. Which is your favorite? My favorite what? Uh, uh, Afrobeat Afro song. My favorite Afrobeat song. Or at least one Probably that. the last song that I just dropped, Lockdown. 2.0 Why am Camido. I not surprised, really? <laughs> but which of the artists, which Nigerian artist or African artist inspired you to go Apple Beats? Actually, it was like, you might even laugh, but I used to listen to P Square. And I loved how they mixed like the RB vibes into the Afro Beats and made it more like the fusion. And making more Afro pop. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Chop my money. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think Cool and the Gang had that kind of vibe as well. Mm -hmm. Did a lot of uh, funk with R and B. So maybe that's one of the uh, inspirations there. Now, how are young people reacting to Afro beats? Just in my question. In Austria, they're yeah. loving it, and I feel like it's all like it's the young people's work as well that Afro beats has a place in Austria as well because like uh, we have a lot of like as I said African communities in Austria doing like events where they have Afrobeats um, doing dance classes Afro dance classes as well so I feel like it's like our generation right now who's bringing it more into the scene and making it more known okay I, I we've played like two of at least two of your of your videos today mm -hmm. and um, I see that you collaborated with one uh, artist there. Tell us, I mean, you, you talked about Lockdown 2.0? Mm -hmm. Yes. So who are you featuring this time, Alera? <laughs> I'm just asking. I mean, you can come and join if you want to. But what's this video no, you're making? Um, the sing new single is called More. Um, it's just by myself. I'm not okay. going to feature anybody on this song. And I'm shooting the video tomorrow for it. And it's dropping on the 27th of March this month. And I'm super excited about that. Why did you choose to come and shoot it in Nigeria? Um, because I actually came and wanted to stay for a while to do also like more music, to just be here. And also I wanted to, um, you know, work with um, this upcoming director called Leroy and um, see what he's about. So. I'm always open to to working with like new people and young ones. Mm. Okay. Have you connected with any Afrobeats people in Nigeria? Yes, I've been doing like uh, music with a lot of producers as well. Um, uh, I, I'm going to drop a song with Young John. I'm going to have a track with Odomodu Black. Um, so there is a lot of things pending already. Uh, Things are happening. Things are happening. <laughs> Good. So we expect to hear a lot more about you this year. Yes. A lot definitely. is coming out this a year. A lot is coming this year. And now, like, thank God the pandemic is over because I couldn't come. But now I'll be coming more often. Yes. I'm definitely off thinking like having a base here. Home is home. Right. Rose, May, Alaba. Do we have any messages? No, no, no. no. Okay. A name. Rosemary Alaba. Anyway, you, you, that's another story for another day. Thank well, you so much for being here today. We wish you all the best. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And we're happy that you have connected with your roots. And like I said before we came on air, it's a pity that there is a Filipino there somewhere because the person I'm looking at is a pure black woman, <laughs> a pure Nigerian woman. Omo Auguste. <laughs> right. Do you understand your Omo Yoruba. <laughs> Do you want okay. to hear about it? I think she's going to rap in Yoruba. No, 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 no. Please, oh, please, oh, Just please. Just say it. No, 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 no. It was offended. a joke. I'm offended. It was a joke. You don't speak <laughs> Yoruba at all? No, I don't speak Yoruba. Do you what understand? does this Omo Yoruba that you just said? <laughs> um, child of Yoruba. Oh, you know that one. <laughs> it's okay. At least you are not totally lost. <laughs> Rosemary <laughs> Alaba, thank you very much for coming, and we wish you all the best. Thank you so and much. And we look forward to hosting you again when all those things drop. 
Right. And we hope you will keep us posted. Thank you for supporting. I okay. appreciate it. So that's our show for today. Thank you for staying with us this long. And we hope that you will tune in again next week, same time, same station. My name is Alero Edu, wishing you all the best. You know, we told you that um, sunrise is in the process of rebirthing. Don't worry. It's coming. Amaya Makinde, do have a beautiful rest of your weekend. Bye for now. Bye. What about ballooning debt pro Business team every weekday at 1 p.m. on Business Incorporated, only on Channels Television.